We've got another fantastic session coming up for you right now, and I believe you're pretty keen to, to introduce a few of these, these people in this next session. I believe you know a few of them. Oh, uh, most of these people, on, or all of the people on this panel, are very close to my heart and have been amazing contributors to the Liberty Movement in Australia, beginning with Andrew Pickford, who, was, who is the Executive Director of the Mancal, uh, uh, Mancal Group, which you would know if you are an international uh, watching. Mancal sends interns, great young people all across the world. And when I travel in, in, uh, internationally, when I can, I hear so much about how wonderful these young people are and how many opportunities that Mankel are mm. providing these young people. So I think that's brilliant and work that he's doing. I'll second that. I, I meet them every year at the Freedman Conference when it normally runs in Sydney. And it is always one of the highlights is talking to some of these young people that have been handpicked and given these scholarships. And it's, it's going to be really exciting to see in future years where these young people end up. Yeah, and, and I know from Generation Liberty, some of them have ended up mm. working with us campus coordinators. Mm. We, we nab them all the time. Mm. But we also have the wonderful Sinclair Davidson, who is a professor of economics at RMIT. He's also an adjunct fellow with the ATA and a senior fellow at the Institute of Public Affairs. So he wears many, many hats. Uh, and then we have a, someone who I would also describe as a modern day heroine, mm -hmm. someone, a true role model about what it really means to speak honestly and to speak the truth no matter what, and that is, of course, the amazing, the reverent, the just beautiful Jacinta Price. Who has paid an incredibly high price for being willing to speak up for the truth as well. I have nothing but just the absolute highest regard Yes, yes. for her and her courage. Absolutely, absolute privilege to have her on. Mm. And the last panellist is uh, Tom Switzer, the Executive mm. Director of the Centre of Independent Studies, who are an amazing organisation who set a standard for excellent research in Australia and they are doing really, really great work. So maybe we'll throw to you first, Tom. Tom, what ideas are going to fix Australia? I think I can speak. I think I can speak. You there? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we yes. can now. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I That's think right. um, you know the coronavirus crisis uh, taken together with the rise of this so-called cancel culture uh, have put many free marketeers and classical liberals and broadly people who are subscribing to the Freedom Conference ethos. We're on the back foot now because we've seen a huge expansion of the role of the state, that the size and the scope of the government has increased dramatically. And many of us used to uh, fret and wail about how the, the, the federal government increased dramatically during the Rudd-Gillard era with Gonski and NBN and um, various other interventionist government programs and, of course, the big stimulus packages. But uh, what Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg have done, and indeed this is happening all around the world, a dwarfs anything that Rudd and Gillard and other governments did during the financial crisis more than a decade ago. And I think uh, from, from our classical liberal perspective, it's imperative that our leaders, on both sides of politics, try to use this crisis as a licence to put in place policies that don't increase the size of government, that don't put uh, a higher burden on taxpayers, but instead liberate what, uh, of all people, John Maynard Keynes called the animal spirits of the economy, a kickstart growth. And the best way of doing that, of course, is via sound productivity enhancing reforms that give more incentives to employers, to wealth creators, to hire and uh, just get the economy moving again. And it's going to be tough because reform fatigue has been evident in Canberra for a long period of time. Uh, but we think that Josh Frydenberg, especially Morrison, perhaps less so, I think instinctively know but the way out of this crisis is via the market economy and the private sector, not via the heavy hand of the nanny state. So that's one issue. The second issue, of course, which really goes to the heart of the matter when it comes to uh, liberalism, is this question about um, freedom of speech. And uh, we've seen so many examples in recent years, and it's really intriguingly escalated since the death of, of George Floyd, the, the rise of this so-called cancel culture. And uh, I, I think that a big challenge for all of us is to protect freedom of speech. Uh, it's such a serious challenge that faces genuine free thinkers in coming years. And when you think about that, it's terrifying that those of us living in free societies should have to face such a thing. I mean, that, the whole hallmark of living in a liberal society is you have freedom of speech. 
But unfortunately, throughout the course of the last few eight months and years, we've seen so many examples of um, people who just air their views on Twitter and then pay a huge price. I mean, a good example of, of this is a University of Chicago economist um, who put out a tweet uh, a week or two after the, um, the death of George Floyd. And, and all he said was uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, quote, just torpedoed itself with its full-fledged support of hashtag defund the police. Now, uh, he was almost immediately kicked off uh, the Chicago Federal Reserve. There's been all sorts of calls for him to lose his editorship of the of, of, of an economic journal, an academic journal. Now there are calls for him to lose his tenure at Chicago University for just putting out a tweet tweet uh, that challenges the consensus of the Black Lives Matter. So this is a very serious issue. It goes to the fundamental nature of living in a free society. And, and I think that really is what we're about. We want to kickstart the economy to deal with the a crisis of coronavirus and the the, the economic uh, recession that we, we are facing. But we also need to redouble our efforts to protect free speech. Thirdly and finally, and this is a bit different for Friedman, but I do think in the face of a rise in China, this presents all sorts of foreign policy challenges for Australia. And I think that for many decades now, our leaders have done a very good job of reconciling relationships with our largest a trade partner, China, uh, with uh, with uh, our most important security partner, and that, of course, is the United States. But I think uh, that task is now almost impossible. It's a bit like riding two horses simultaneously, and those two horses, especially since the onset of the coronavirus, have gone further and further apart. And, and as Professor John Mearsheimer from Chicago University, he came to uh, the CIS last year, made it very clear, uh, this security and economic competition between Beijing and Washington will escalate dramatically, and Australia will eventually be forced to choose, and I think that choice will be with America in the face of a rise in China. And I think, by the way, we'll see more and more countries in the region, including India, Vietnam, countries that aren't naturally pro-American, they will be on the American bandwagon to contain a rise in China. So they're the three issues for me and CIS, uh, economics, uh, cultural, i.e. freedom of speech, and the rise of China. Thank you so much for that, Tom. Really appreciate that insight and, uh, and really that opening of this topic. Now, we haven't actually premeditated who's going to speak next. So I'm going to have a look and see Sinclair, uh, Andrew, Jacinta, who would like to put your hand up and, uh, and jump in next? Andrew, I see that hand. I see that hand, brother. Uh, unmute yourself, Andrew. We'd love to hear what you've prepared for us today. Thank you, and uh, thank you for, uh, for hosting this, Friedman. We are very pleased to be a long-term supporter of the uh, conference. Uh, we've been here for supporting it for quite some time. Um, we actually, uh, unlike Victoria, we're a bit freer here and we're hosting a viewing party. So if you hear uh, noise in the background, that's from the, the students that we've assembled to, uh, to join in and listen to the speakers throughout the day. And Friedman really matches with Ron's um, uh, support of youth, activity, and, and now technology, given we're very adaptable. So I'm going to give a few brief comments, and I frame them as a view, view from the West. Uh, WA is really the engine room of the economy, and we're well outside the bubble of Canberra, Melbourne and Sydney that uh, I think um, uh, has sort of captured a lot of the policy making. So I, I really want to echo, and I, my notes are really mirror a lot of t uh, Tom's comments, that we uh, must acknowledge a few trends that we have to deal with as we look to fixing Australia, and I would say uh, fixing is probably the wrong word because there's a lot about Australia that's great and we need to return to some of these, uh, these traditions. So firstly, COVID has opened the door to big government, but as Tom indicated, this was well entrained before COVID. The other one I think it needs a lot of attention and, and I, I gather is the topic of the next session is a rise in China and a, a larger budgets for defence and what does that mean? It doesn't necessarily have to mean big government across all sectors. Uh, and the other final point in terms of framing uh, is the, the expectations of the community to fix problems, be they large or small. This is an, in, it is an unsatiable uh, appetite and demand for many in the, uh, in the public to essentially expect government to solve problems. 
So we are dealing with all of these challenges uh, well beyond COVID and the current noise, and we do have to acknowledge them. So I will, and I've been counselled by my colleague Eva not to talk about boring white paper matters, but I'll just quickly get in and preempt uh, what I think Sinclair will say is that, of course, we want a flatter tax structure, greater state autonomy, deregulation, removal of red tape, all as a, as a sort of a, as an economic policy setting. And I, I will defer to him as he speaks about his great new book and, um, and some of the work he's doing at RMIT. So I have three, three main ideas about how we fix in Australia, but really how we return to a more prosperous era. Firstly is how we should capture and tell stories of real heroes. Western Australia was made wealthy by pioneers, uh, entrepreneurs and inventors. And they did a lot of their work without any involvement of the government or any, any impediments. So it really is a sign that, that people solve problems, entrepreneurs create outcomes, and there's a lot of stories that, that need to be told that we're working on here at Mancal and I'm working on more broadly. So we can show that our history is not one of negatives or problems, and, and WA through Kalgoorlie, and, and it's in our name, Mancal, there's a lot of people who've worked on the frontier, on the fringes that have created great outcomes and, and is a fantastic story. So we, we take the lead from Larry Reid at Fee and we will be telling more of the real hero stories. Uh, the other one is a really a WA idea or, or a, an issue is to be pro-development and pro-energy. So one thing we've seen is that a lot of our energy projects uh, have been disrupted by FIFO green activists or those who are simply anti-development of any kind. And that has really impacted people in the communities where these jobs are necessarily and important. So frankly, I'm not concerned what energy source uh, is, is used. And I think nuclear should be on that list of potential sources. But I think we should get back to the use, extraction and export of energy being a positive and the same with development. And that has been the story of Western Australia for, for many decades. And I think that it's, it's a problem when activists and uh, adventurous policymaking gets imported from Canberra and Melbourne and Sydney, because what is good for Western Australia is good for the Australian economy. And that's something that, that really needs to, to be considered. And the final idea I have is, is of no secret, and it's really what Mankell does and it fits with Ron's vision, is investing in youth. So we've narrowly focused on developing future free market leaders, which I know the, uh, the chairs of the session have referred to, and a lot of people do bump into Macau students uh, in and around the, the traps of think tanks and conferences and, and travelling around, and we're really proud of that, and we, we're going to continue doing that and expanding the program, bringing in more students, and, and hopefully uh, when we can, getting them out and about as well. So on that, on that theme, we're going to actually be exploring some of our alumni's efforts in, in starting own businesses, um, uh, undertaking new ventures, and, and really we'd love to see uh, Mancal types or others um, pop up in other states to, to follow, follow this lead. So those three ones about telling stories, uh, being pro-energy and pro-development, and really investing in our youth will, will hopefully set the country on the right path for long-term prosperity, and also address some of the uh, matters that Tom talked about, and I'm sure Sinclair flagged in his earlier, in his subsequent, uh, will flag in his subsequent talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I really need you guys to hold the fort over there in Western Australia, even as the rest mm -hmm. of the country is going crazy, uh, because if it gets much worse here in Victoria, I'm gonna become a refugee. <laughs> uh, and I'll be I'll be heading to WA, and I'm counting on you guys to still have some freedom left by the time I get there. But uh, thank you for that contribution. I really appreciate that. Now, what if uh, what if we go to Jacinta? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this particular issue, and particularly concerning a lot of the the, the issues that you you're talking about and you're really pushing for, broadly speaking, and how they factor into how we can potentially fix Australia and the, the challenges that we're facing now. Sure. Um... 
I'm sort of sitting here listening and I'm, I'm thinking a hundred thoughts at, at once, thinking sort of where do we start with all of this? And I have to agree with uh, much of what, um, what Tom was talking about in terms of free speech in Australia when it comes to particularly Indigenous issues. Uh, there is not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily exist uh, Obviously, we're seeing huge racial, you know, divisions taking place because of um, because of what's occurred in the U.S. And you know, there are those here in Australia who would like to adopt um, those racial divisions and apply them in our country, where I feel there is no place for them. And the situation that we're faced with, this topsy turvy world that we're faced with, is largely um, born out of identity politics, uh, which which is very damaging, which has been very damaging um, for all involved. We we can't, if we thought it was hard enough to try and address Indigenous issues with a level of honesty uh, before, it's certainly much harder now. Uh, so, so, yeah, so where do I start, I guess? Um, for when... When our current um, Minister for Indigenous Australians was first appointed, I, I, had a, I felt a sense of hope that perhaps we might be steered in a direction that this country needs to go in terms of Indigenous policy. And he was saying the right sorts of things where he was talking about uh, the fact that a lot of Aboriginal corporations and leaders of these um, big corporations aren't necessarily in touch with grassroots Indigenous people, which is certainly the feeling amongst a lot of Indigenous people in regional and remote areas. Um, there are certainly places that are, uh, places, organisations and corporations that are um, in touch with grassroots Indigenous Australians, but in some of these situations, you have like uh, the gentleman Mark Kulmatry, who was uh, who whose article was in the Australian this week talking about tens of millions of uh, dollars that go to these large corporations, which allows for nepotism and corruption to flourish, and for um, you know sometimes family dynasties to continue their reign over these sorts of organisations. And we haven't had um, we haven't had a real deep look into this issue, and we haven't been allowed to uh, tackle these sorts of, sorts of issues or challenge these issues because these are technically race-based issues, if you like. Uh, if we are to, and, and I agree, I think, you know, we have a wonderful country, uh, but there's always room for improvement. Um, and, and I think a, a place to start before we can even look into trying to apply new policy or even do things as as the, uh, the minister has suggested in terms of changing targets and, and funneling millions more into these uh, Aboriginal corporations, giving them even more power, is we need to take, take a step back and we need to take a fine tooth comb to um, understand how money has been spent and largely failed to advance Indigenous Australians. Uh, and we need to we need to look at who has who has been driving this well who who's been at the helm um, during during these failures aside from you know the government you know the governments over the over the decades who else has been at the helm because as as um, Mark's article in the Australian suggests none of these organisations or corporations are. Uh, Nobody is ever held to account for their failings. And these, these are corporations that are tasked with uh, ensuring that Indigenous Australians uh, can, can close the gap. Uh, so that's, that's, that's just a simple starting point there. The, the other issue we need to look at and uh, what prevents us from discussing these sorts of issues when it comes to uh, Indigenous Australians is... Where does the gap lie? The gap lies, as far as I'm concerned, between not between white Australia and Indigenous Australia, but between marginalised Aboriginal people and the rest of Australia that are made up of uh, also Aboriginal, people of Aboriginal descent who are largely doing quite well in their lives. 
So we've got a point where we've at a, we're at a stage where, uh, you know, you can tick a box and identify as an, as an Aboriginal Australian and, the, and that determines where funds are spent, uh, where federal funds are spent is, is, by, is by the population of, you know, those that um, claim Aboriginality. I think we have to take it back to uh, ensuring that we're supporting individuals based on need. Uh, we should be means testing. Uh, and it shouldn't solely be about whether someone can identify as Aboriginal or not, because being Aboriginal doesn't determine whether you are marginalised or not. Uh, and I would also take into account whether your first language is in fact English. So there's another area that uh, requires improvement, but because of identity politics, we are not allowed to talk about these sorts of issues honestly and openly. Uh, the, the argument from often from the left is, you know, uh, it, it comes down to people per, you know, on a personal level. You know, you, you, you are Indigenous if you, if, um, you know, you, you, if you're Indigenous, it doesn't, you can come from many different backgrounds. You, you, you don't have to speak a language. You don't, you, 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 it doesn't, you don't have to have dark skin, all of those sorts of things. It brings it back to that personal identity politics level, whereas we shouldn't be focused on that, but we are, unfortunately. And if we try to remove focus or try to challenge those notions, well, you're called a race traitor if you're someone like myself or, if, or you're, you're called a racist um, otherwise. And this is what is doing great damage, I believe, and not allowing us to um, really use constructive criticism to move forward uh, in the area of in Indigenous policy. Uh, one thing that I think has uh, come about because of what's going on in the US uh, is, is more and more African-American conservatives are having a voice, having the opportunity to speak out and be heard. Uh, although again, they're being called race traitors. It's very slow to, for the uptake here in Australia, but I'm hopeful uh, that more and more, uh, you know, differing voices can stand up and can be heard. Uh, but, but there needs to be far more support for that sort of thing. And I, and I think, I think I have hope in Australia, uh, as Australians, we have that level of resilience in us that we can pull it back to some sort of level of common sense where that can be the case. Uh, but yeah, they're just a few of the things I, I think when it comes to Indigenous policy that, that certainly need improvement and, and leaves the door open for a lot more conversation to take place. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jacinda. Really appreciate your thoughts. And uh, I know already there's been a few questions come in that are going to be uh, probably directed more at you than at the rest of the panellists uh, when we get to the Q&A time at the end. But just before we do that, uh, we do, of course, have the wonderful Sinclair Davidson uh, a man who, uh, as my co-host a moment ago, introduced as wearing many hats. Uh, and you can see he's got a wonderful head for it. Well, where else would you want to put all of your hats? Uh, Sinclair Davidson, please share with us what you've got. Well, uh, hi, Tofa. Um, thank you very much again for the invitation. I, th I think I've spoken at almost, I I've spoken at every single Friedman conference uh, uh, over the years. And uh, uh, as people have kind of foreshadowed, I've always got the same story. And the, the story is always cut taxes, cut red tape, cut green tape, cut page tape, um, all this and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm going to say exa exactly the same thing again today. But um, the, 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 the COVID crisis, I think, has given us um, in, in, in sort of the, the, the freedom tradition, the, the liberal tradition. I know there was a discussion earlier on as to what is liberal and all that sort of stuff. But I think liberal, in, as we in Australia understand it, uh, sensible, centre-right type people. Um, I, I think the, the, this has given us a wonderful opportunity. Now, um, why do I say this? Well, the other night I was speaking to the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. And the question I was asked was, name one good thing that's come out of COVID and one bad thing that's come out of COVID. And the good thing I said that had come out of COVID is the digital economy acceleration that we have seen. So I'm sitting now in my home in Melbourne under lockdown. Uh, the zombies are running around outside, probably eating brains and what have you. Um, and we're participating in a worldwide conference on Zoom. Um, I'm terrified that even when governments do allow us to travel, that our technology will have improved so much that we won't have to travel. 
um, the IEA won't be paying for me to fly to London and give a talk anymore because they'll say, Sink, you can do this from home. So the digital revolution and acceleration that we've seen is, is, is fantastic, astonishing. Um, the bad thing that's happened are the millions upon millions of people who have lost their livelihoods, their jobs, their businesses, all those sorts of things. Um, today in the Australian, there's an article about how only now we're we starting to realise the cost of closing the borders. Well, I think people were talking about this for a long time, so it's, it's actually a bit disappointing that people are now saying, gee, only now we keep up. But, so what's the story? My colleagues and I sat down and wrote very quickly a book published by uh, Jeffrey Tucker and his friends in the United States called Unfreeze, How to Create a High Growth Economy. Our argument now is that the COVID crisis is actually a tipping point in, in our society. This actually allows us to hit the reset button and say, okay, uh, we've been doing things like we've been doing for thousands of years. Uh, uh, the state has grown as it's grown for, for hundreds of years. And now all of a sudden we can actually say, okay, let's start again. And we can start again because, to be quite honest, our economy is dead. Um, the, the whole notion that you can put an economy into the deep fridge and then just take it out and thaw it out, or you can hit a pause button on an economy, is actually a fantasy. The notion, the economy that we had, our wealth that we had as recently as February of this year is gone. We are a lot poorer now than what we were then. Our economy is a lot smaller now than what it was then. And the problem that we now face is that the government that we have and the size of government and the scope of government is designed for an economy of February of 2020, and here we are in July 2020 in a much smaller place. So my colleagues and I said, well, first of all, we want to explain that point. You can't just, un you just can't freeze an economy and then unfreeze it. And the next point we wanted to explain is what are we going to do about it? Now, all the usual suspects are talking about monetary and fiscal policy. So we've got interest rates at 0.25%. Um, the Federal, the, the, the Reserve Bank of Australia have been trying to push on that piece of string now for 10 years and nothing's come of it. Why they think all of a sudden pushing lower interest rates now is going to do anything, I don't know. And then, of course, ma uh, massive fiscal policy. Everybody's talking about, well, we're going to borrow more and we're going to spend more and we're going to tax more. And there's some crazy ideas about taxation out at the moment. Um, yesterday, I think in the Sydney Morning Herald, they were talking about trying to come up with some progressive GST rate and all this sort of stuff. That's, that's all nonsense. We should not be talking at all about increasing taxes. Um, yes, we've got to pay off a lot of debt. And how are we going to pay off that debt now is we've got to grow out of it. We can't simply uh, um, increase taxes to pay off uh, uh, the, the debts that we've got that are phenomenal. We actually have to grow out of it. We have to grow our economy. And that means we have to have a long period of time of very high growth, first of all, to pay for what we have spent already. Okay, so the billions of dollars that we've spent already is money that's gone. We have to pay for that. Plus, we have to restore our wealth to where it was in February of 2020. The way we're going to do that is by growing, massively expanding the economy. Um, I don't want to upset Tom, but uh, uh, it is glorious to be rich, as a, a, a famous Chinese dictator once said, um, and we should be uh, 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 trying to be rich. And the way we're going to do that, of course, is all the usual stuff, flat taxes, lower taxes, lower regulation. We know when the COVID crisis hit, one of the first things governments did do was abolish payroll tax because they know payroll tax is a, is a tax on jobs. What else did they do? They reduced all sorts of other regulations in the economy, which says to me that they knew all along that those regulations were bad, that those taxes were bad, but they've kept them in place nonetheless. So uh, uh, do away with a lot of regulation, do away with also all the regulation and taxes that have been temporarily uh, uh, abolished should be permanently abolished. Uh, we should have a flat tax. We should allow entrepreneurship to, 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 to blossom and bloom. Um, all the anti-business regulations that we have that Andrew spoke about there that's stifling things up in the West need to go. Um, this is going to be perhaps a bit more controversial. We need, we need more localism. 
Uh, we need more local uh, 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 um, solutions to problems. And dare I say it, we need to look long and hard about is the Commonwealth of Australia, the federal government, really the right thing for us? Uh, maybe we should think about devolving back into six or seven separate countries, um, doing away with Canberra, doing away with all the centralism. Um, um, maybe Andrew would like this idea, but Western Australia should be independent. Um, uh, Victoria should be independent. We are independent right now. We are surrounded by a ring of steel, um, you know, the old Berlin Wall. Um, so, but, but we need to think about local solutions um, for, for local problems, perhaps even go our own ways. Think what is all the centralization doing for us really? Um, and so uh, um, um, actual federalism at the very least, this notion of the national cabinet is an absolute abomination. Um, it's also probably unconstitutional, um, shouldn't be allowed. So all the things I've been talking about for the last uh, eight years at Friedman, including uh, dissolving the Commonwealth, which uh, really annoyed John Stone um, at the time, um, <laughs> are, are ideas that we should uh, revisit and think about because we have this opportunity now to reset. Thank you, Tofa. Well, thank you, Sinclair, and thank you to each and every one of you. Uh, we've had a, a, quite a few questions coming through and I, I want to kind of collect a few of the questions into one and kind of paraphrase it into my own words and, and direct it to all of you. Do you see cause for optimism in all of this? I mean, what's happened in the last few months, really since the start of 2020, in terms of all of what we've talked about, the, the growth in spending and the size of government, uh, the, the reduction in our liberty, the impact on our civil liberties, uh, the, the deterioration of civil discourse, particularly around things like race and so forth, uh, there's, there's been a lot of cause for pessimism in the last six or seven months. Uh, do any of you see causes for optimism at this point in time? Do you see some silver linings that might come through on the tail end of this uh, and make the picture a little bit, uh, a little bit less bleak? I'll go That's ahead. directed at no one in particular. Um, I'm, I'm always very optimistic. I have a lot of faith in our country because we are one of the the greatest countries um, and and I think uh, in some ways uh, this sort of what we've been challenged with I think I think we can meet those challenges as a nation and I think it's also in some ways for those you know we've talked about the quiet Australians a lot and um, they do exist but now I think they're realizing uh, because of what we've been confronted with, that they they have to take the opportunity to actually stand up and stop being silent on on these particular issues to um, to once again try and reestablish our, our Australian values as as a group of people who are all actually in this together, uh, and understanding that we shouldn't allow um, allow issues being brought over from other countries to to divide us. Uh, and, and I think a lot of Australians are certainly waking up to that. Um, I'm also optimistic, I guess, I hope, well, I'm hoping that because of the fact that we are now dealing with the economy that, that no longer exists, that we are going to have to really think about how we fund um, issues of uh, policy affecting Indigenous Australians. We can't just, we can't just keep continuing to throw money at it. So we have to be a lot smarter and I think the Australian people are going to certainly demand that we be a lot smarter about it and actually um, do things that are going to, instead of trying to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, is what we're seeing, but actually try some more common sense approaches uh, towards solving these issues and, and live within our means, if you like, as well. So, so just can I do you... Oh, sorry. Can I come back to you in a second, Andrew? Um, Jacinda, do you do you feel like a lone voice within the Indigenous community when you are advocating for what you're advocating for, or do you find that there are perhaps uh, more people than maybe willing to publicly come out and admit it who who really do see sense in, in what you're saying? There are there are definitely um, a lot of people out there who see the sense in it, who are fearful of um, being very public. You know, that people have. Seen what's you know how I've been targeted uh, but I can tell a lot of people out there it doesn't really you know <laughs> it, I, I'm not physically hurt in any any particular way there are those that are worse off than me so if you find yourself in a position I encourage people to come out and talk about these things and I think there is a bit of a groundswell 
taking place and, and other others like um, Warren Mundine and Anthony yeah. Dillon, uh, you know, I know Josephine Cashman is really talking out about a lot of these issues and uh, we all have networks of people and it's about in, in, uh, trying to encourage them to come forward uh, and, and speak about these issues. Uh, and there are those who are quietly chipping away in their communities as well, um, you know, to the best of their own ability to do so. But a shift is definitely happening, and that's why I'm, I'm optimistic as well. Wonderful. Good to hear. Sorry to cut you off there, Andrew. What do you see as a cause for optimism out of all of this? I have a, a caveat. I see optimism after um, what will be coming up to the US election a lot right. of importing of, of cultural left um, crusades, cancel culture, um, straight from New York Times to the, the usual suspects here in Australia. Um, after that, I, I see after the, and, and there'll be the echoes and, and I think that'll increase. So short term, not great. But after that, I think really forcing some hard decisions and, and, and localism, which are uh, which um, Sinclair talked about, I think that, that'll flush out a lot of things and, and it will be great because um, state governments especially will have to look to create solutions and not just rely on Canberra because at some point um, the flow of money will, will, will have to stop. Mm. Now, Sinclair, I am, I am all on board everything that you've said about lowering taxes and particularly reducing the, the burden of regulation. I, I do want to give one quick illustration followed by a question. Um, I've been working with some business partners for some years now on a new go-karting centre down here in Melbourne. We were stuck in the council planning uh, process for two and a half years. And then when we finally got through that, we got dragged immediately into VCAP by one vexatious uh, person who wanted to try and slow us down for reasons of his own and lost another six months of, of my life, uh, in total three years of my life, just trying to get permission from the government to build a building and to build a racetrack on a, on a piece of land that is currently unused. And what strikes me about that is, is that's not just obviously hurting me and my family and my investors and so forth. It's also hurting the prospects of everyone that I would have employed over the last few years. It also means that all of the customers that would have come along have had to choose a, an option that they, they, they wouldn't have chosen had we been there. So they've chosen a second best uh, option. And then the taxpayers worse off as well, because we would have generated somewhere in the order of two to three million dollars just in GST by this point in time, had we been able to open way back when we originally thought we were going to before we just hit regulatory hurdle after regulatory hurdle. So my question for you is, is twofold. Yes, we've seen a couple of, a bit of nibbling at the edges of, of a few regulations being scaled back and that sort of thing, but I would argue so little in comparison to what we need to see here in Australia. So do you really think that that's going to spread? And secondly, do you believe that we'll be able to hold on to those, uh, and this is now a question from the audience, do you believe we'll be able to hold on to those improvements going forward or as prosperity comes back, as growth comes back, do you think we're just going to return to that same regulation that we've seen before? Well, the my, my argument is that the, this whole notion of a snapback, where we're just suddenly all one day going to go back to work, um, squeeze into our business clothes, uh, um, stop our day drinking, and immediately become productive <laughs> members of society again, um, is, is, is actually a bit of a fantasy. Um, I, I think the world has changed, and I think... Right now, the economic crisis is masked by the fact that JobKeeper is in place and, and, and JobSeeker and what have you. Um, and, and to be fair to the government, they, they, they borrowed a lot of money to basically pay people to sit at home and do nothing to maintain the social fabric of our society. So I, I don't want to be too critical on, on what they did at very short notice. But my view is the economic crisis is still going to happen. Um, in come September, when those payments stop, that's when the unemployment rate will actually become obvious. So yeah. I get to make right now the unemployment rate is about 10%. It's not obviously 10% because we've still got people with money in their pockets. They can still pay their bills. But when the crisis does actually hit, many of those people are not going to work again. Many of those businesses are going to disappear the minute that support disappears. And that's going to focus the mind. Um, it's and, and it's going to focus the mind in a way which our minds have never been focused before. Um, Australia is a, is, a, is a wealthy country. Um, there is work for people who want to work, who can work. You know, so it, it's been a, a wonderful opportunity out there just waiting to be grabbed. Well, all of a sudden, 
um, there's going to be a government official standing between you and putting food on the table saying, oh, gee, you can't really work here because of some regulation or we don't want that person to give you a job because of this. Um, and people are going to be looking a, a long, hard look at that sort of stuff and saying, actually, I want to work. There's a person who wants to employ me. Um, and, and why are you stopping this from happening? So I actually think this is going to focus the mind in ways which we haven't seen focused ever before. Um, and uh, we, uh, we, thankfully, we still do live in a democracy and governments will respond to uh, pressure from the electorate. It, it is unsustainable for a country like Australia to have 12, 14% unemployment for a long period of time without anything being done about it. And I suspect we will see something being done about it and sooner rather than later. It is interesting to think, as, as I think certainly about myself, I was a little bit too young in the, uh, the recession we had to have to have really personally felt the impact of that. And since then, really, Australia has been sheltered from every economic shock since. We weren't really hit by the, the, the whole Asian bubble that, that burst. We weren't really hit by the dot-com bubble. Um, West Australia will be, will be pleased to hear me say that we've really ridden on the back of resources and, uh, and what they've done for us over the, the last number of years. For many people my age and younger, this really is the first time we've ever seen anything like this. And if the predictions are correct and this turns into the, the worst recession since the 1930s or, or perhaps even since before then, uh, then it'll, it'll become a situation where no one alive has really seen something like this before. And I can, I can only hope that the right lessons will be learned and certainly a, a refocusing on supporting those that are creating jobs and creating opportunities rather than viewing them as, as a cow to be milked, if I can uh, steal somebody else's knowledge. Um, to, to give us some, some context... Um, if you were working, if, if you were working during the, the, the recession we had to have in the early 90s, you are now close to retirement age. So in terms mm. of the population age, or, or the, 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 yeah, Tom, you have to be about 55 or so, you can retire, access your super. Um, you would be, you're close to the age which you could be retiring. So the working population of Australia mostly has not experienced a recession, mostly has never really had to worry about putting food on the table, mostly has never had to thought about will they ever work again. Um, and these are thoughts you should be having right now. And uh, our, our, our politician friends in Canberra and in, in Spring Street and Melbourne and all these other places need to be thinking long and hard about what it is that they're going to be doing to create jobs, to create businesses, to create employment opportunities. And that largely means getting out of the way and letting the entrepreneurial spirit rip. Mm. So, Tom, what are your thoughts then? Is this an opportunity for advancing the ideas of liberty? Is, is there a you know, never let a crisis go to waste? I, I hate to sort of steal the rhetoric of people whose politics I very strongly disagree with, but is there an element of that here? Is this actually an opportunity if we look at it the right way? Well, that's a very good point. I think it is hard to be an optimist during a crisis. And I think it's, as Sinclair suggested, it, this will probably be the worst economic crisis we've faced since the 1930s. However, you know, we need to be measured about this and recognise that modern Australian history uh, shows that, funnily enough, a crisis is a good opportunity to implement a kind of far-reaching, wide-ranging structural reform agenda that will kickstart the economy and put in place sound market-oriented policies to boost growth and increase the prospects of a new era of prosperity. I mean, every so often we have suffered some setbacks. Um, I think actually more about the economic crisis this country did face in the mid-1980s. If you go back there, we had a balance of payments and currency crisis. It was, of all people, a Labor trade union leader in Bob Hawke and his treasurer, Paul Keating, with it should be stressed bipartisan support, most notably John Howard, who so was in the mid-1980s. Consensus was that Australia risked becoming a banana republic unless we transformed our economy. Because you have to remember, from 1901, from the time we became an independent state, right through to the early to mid-'80s, Australia still had a very a highly protected uh, and overly subsidised economy. The unions represented a very significant percentage of the workforce. And the crisis gave Bob Hawke and the Labor government an opportunity to implement a radical agenda of tariff cuts, a deregulation, privatisation, and that laid the foundations of our long boom. We will talk about the recession in the early 1990s. 
uh, that's true. But in many respects, uh, the recession was in response to the um, higher inflation. So the Reserve Bank was putting up interest rates, just like the Federal Reserve put up interest rates to control the inflation genie, which they did. A decade later, um, John Howard and Peter Costello came to power. The circumstances were a bit different. There was a shock of the early 90s, and that was still very much imprinted on the national psyche. And that gave the coalition government an opportunity to repair the budget and implement some economic reform, such as tax reform. This is going to be a lot bigger crisis, um, and it's not clear whether the coalition and the Labor are brave enough uh, to push a reform agenda onto what is a sceptical electorate. But as you said at the outset, uh, I think it was Rahm Emanuel, Barack Obama's um, chief of staff, when Rahm, Barack Obama came to uh, the office when he won the election in early uh, 2000, uh, late 2008, early 2009, he came to power. Rahm Emanuel famously said, never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what he meant by that is it's an opportunity to do the things you couldn't do before. Well, in our case, we've had many governments that have wanted to put in place sound free market policies, but they haven't had the, um, the opportunity to do so. We can only hope we can do that. One thing I would put back to Sinclair, Sinclair and I go back more than two decades ago, I commissioned him to write a very good piece of the Financial Review in defence of free trade was in response to all those anti-globalisation riots we were seeing in the late 1990s. I'm sure Sinclair remembers that. But I noticed that Sink doesn't mention free trade in his list of things that governments should do. I noticed from some of our members at CIS, and I suspect it's the same at the IPA, there is a segment of our people, centre-right, conservative, liberal people, who are more attracted to the idea of protectionism today than any time in our lives. And it's because we're learning away from China and we want to build a manufacturing sector. So the question I put back to Sink is, do you still have faith in free trade? <laughs> uh, yes, definitely I do. Um, I, I, I still think free... Uh, Australia is a trading economy. We've always been a trading economy. We have to be a trading economy. Our population is simply too small to sustain the levels of wealth that we've come to uh, uh, used to over time. Uh, we have to trade... And uh, I think I'm probably going to disagree with you a bit on China. Uh, we have to trade with China. Um, we, we One of the tenets of free trade is you don't have to like the people you are trading with. Um, we, we, we don't have to like the communist government of China, um, but we do have to work with them and work with the, 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 the Chinese people because at the end of the day, trade is going to benefit us. It's going to benefit the Chinese people a lot more. Um, I'm actually quite optimistic um, around the world for liberalism because I actually think uh, authoritarianism is on the nose. Um, we, 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 we're seeing a lot of authoritarianism in China. Um, more or less, I think they're on their last legs. Um, this, the, the, this is their last gasp. Um, if, if we have a look at the, the crazy things the left are doing now, this is their last gasp. Um, they are losing. Uh, we are winning. And uh, there's going to be more winning. Uh, um, if, if I could just be very self-indulgent. Uh, Mancal, thank you, Ron, very much. Mancal commissioned another book from us called Technologies of Freedom. Uh, we are going to out-technologize. We are going to out-revolutionize uh, the state and regulation, all these sorts of stuff. So, yeah, well, we are winning. Well, thank you, Sinclair. You've actually you've touched on a couple of things there, some of which I've actually never said to anyone. Uh, and one of the things that I was mulling on recently was that what we're seeing in the U.S. culturally with, with a lot of what's being expressed over there and the anger... Uh, as well as what we're seeing out of China and the way they're lashing out against a lot of different countries, uh, it really feels like a spasm. It, it feels like, the way, the way I did put it to one person was, it feels like that last bit of the pendulum swing before it then starts to move back the other way. And, and I hope I'm right. I could very well be, be horrifically wrong. But that's, that's, there's certainly an air of that, particularly when it comes to China, but I think also in some of what we're seeing politically in the US as well. So we can only hope that the right lessons are learned. I can't say I have a huge amount of hope in any of us, of our Australian governments, federal or state, to learn the right lessons and put in place the right policies. But uh, let's hope I'm definitely wrong on that particular point and we start to see some good policies coming through and we can see that real growth that we need. I want to thank each of you for your time and each of you for your perspectives and bringing your unique perspective for the, the parts of the world that you know so much about. And thank you so much for being a part of the 24 Hours of Liberty. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.